Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Paul Howarth. Okay, well, uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, coming from the UK, I'm not used to uh, dramatic entrances. That's uh, about as, uh, as much as uh, I can take. Um, right, uh, I've come from the other country, which is good at doing surprise politics at the moment. And uh, I thought I would uh, just give you a little bit of an insight as far as where the UK is up to. Uh, prior to doing that, just to explain that I'm from the UK National Nuclear Laboratory. Uh, we sort of look like your national laboratories, but sort of don't. We're owned by the government, but we are commercially funded by all the work that we do as far as legacy waste management, uh, new reactor support, existing reactors, uh, defence, etc. So slightly smaller, but uh, perfectly formed. Um, as far as we are concerned in the United Kingdom, we have been on a very interesting journey over the past uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, I've been closely involved in that uh, journey, and I thought I would just explain to you uh, what we've been through. As far as the UK is concerned, of course, uh, we are a country that has closed the nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, we have developed and tried all sorts of different reactors, uh, metal-fueled uh, reactors, oxide, fast reactors, gas-cooled reactors, uh, open fuel cycle, closed fuel cycle. We've, we really have been there, uh, seen the film, read the book, and got the T-shirt as far as nuclear technology is concerned. And we typically have around about 30% uh, of our generating capacity in total is from, is from nuclear. That's falling because our Generation 1 stations are coming off the bars and our Generation 2 stations, the advanced gas-cooled uh, reactors, will come off over the next uh, 10, 15 years. So we need to do something. So enter the 2003 energy policy. And as laudable as it was, uh, because it made a very bold claim that by 2050 we will cut our CO2 emissions by 60%. And we were high-fiving, thinking that's fantastic, great opportunity for nuclear. The only thing was they left out Chapter 4. Chapter 4 was the role of nuclear energy. The government just lost uh, the nerve as far as including nuclear in 2003. And effectively the policy was we're going to phase out nuclear. So the discussions I had with ministers at that time was, thanks for everything that you've done. If you can just run these reactors down to the end of life, uh, switch them off, shut the gates, kick the cat out, job done, uh, you can go home. We don't need nuclear anymore. So uh, we went on quite an interesting journey then, uh, engaging a whole range of different uh, stakeholders, uh, the House of Lords, with industry, with the general public, uh, with ministers to explain that uh, that really was just not feasible and to point out the importance of nuclear. While the government had said in 2003 that uh, renewables would play a key role, we had to show that you need every tool in the toolbox if you're going to address the challenges of, uh, of CO2 uh, emissions. It's very interesting as far as the engagement with ministers was concerned because I would say, look, we need to build nuclear. Nuclear is really important. We have to replace our existing fleet. We cannot lifetime extend them. The answer I got back was, uh, yeah, Paul, we hear you, but no one is coming. No utility is coming to build nuclear in the UK. Therefore, de facto, it's not part of the, the policy. That's really interesting when you take that away because you realise that clearly you've got to de-risk it for the utilities and for the vendors. And there's three things that we looked at putting in place, and that was basically certainty over the generic design assessment process at the front end. Make it easy and certain if you're going to license a new reactor. Second, de-risk it from a financial point of view. This is big money that's involved in these reactors. 17% is your capital cost in terms of levelised generation. 40% is your financing cost associated with it. So give the, the, the utility some certainty in terms of the financial position. And the third one is help them out as far as uh, policy in terms of waste management and disposal is, uh, is concerned. Trying to get those messages across the government, if any of you have been to London, and I'm sure you have, and you've been around Westminster, you'll see there's an awful lot of red buses. And the number of times that I could have come out of one Victoria Street, the Department of Energy, and thrown myself under a red bus... <laughs> Uh, is uncountable. It was a painful period in 2003 up to 2006. But something happened. Something very interestingly happened, and it happened overnight, and we did not foresee this change. Putin cut the gas supplies to the Ukraine overnight. The next day, 
phone rings, come and tell us about nuclear. The government had suddenly realized that energy is not a commodity. The security of supply issue is absolutely essential. And I, and I do hate to say it, but we did in the office have pictures of Putin on the wall as our hero because uh, he, he has helped us as far as our new nuclear bill program is concerned. Then the government said it would launch. I said, OK, we'll launch a consultation into nuclear. If you guys are so right, we'll put it out to the, to the public. We said, do that, but make sure you do it where people cannot respond just by saying no thanks to nuclear. You have to come up with a credible alternative. And that was a really interesting proposition because it meant that people couldn't just say, I don't want nuclear. You had to say why, and you had to come up with an alternative option. We went further, and we developed something called the Energy Calculator. And we put this out on the website to the general public so the general public could even say, look, you, know, you solve the problem. You work out how to get affordable energy security supply and CO2 emission reductions in place. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you an image of a, uh, a very interesting meeting that, that I had uh, around about 2008. And the energy calculator was being developed by the government. We had some very smart whiz kids in that could do all the programming. So effectively, it could go out onto the web and you could play with it yourself as a member of the general, the general public. And this was a trial run of it. And I sat in a room. It's up on display like this. The chief government scientist is there. Different ministers uh, are present and different chief scientists from the different uh, government departments. And I was present as well at the back of the room. Uh, it wasn't all that um, uh, many externals that were invited in, but I was privileged enough to be there. And they said, right, start running the calculator. Let's see what happens between 2050 and 2080 in terms of meeting our CO2 emission reduction targets, but no nuclear. So run it with renewables. They ran the code and they kept on changing the code, they could not close the model. They could not get to 80% reduction CO2 emissions by 2080, whatever they did. Arguments broke out in the room because the whole of the UK had to be converted to biomass, which was pointed out as completely impractical. <laughs> the UK island had been ringed three times in tidal um, uh, energy production devices. Again, we thought, well, that's a bit impractical. Domestic heat, light, and power, domestic home heating had to be reduced to a wintertime temperature of 10 degrees, <laughs> which we thought, that's impractical. And then finally, the government said, OK, ramp up the nukes, and let's see what happens. Don't forget at this point as well that we need to decarbonize, which means that we need to increase our grid size. Our grid at the moment is around about 80 gigawatts. We have to go up to around about 320 gigawatts. And it's typically the same for all countries. You've got to go four times what your current grid is in order to decarbonize for everything else. Everything else. The model closed when the nukes were added in. And it closed when we got to effectively a sustained mix of 100 gigawatts of nuclear, 100 gigawatts of carbon sequestration with fossil fuels, and 100 gigawatts of renewables. There's silence in the room. That was the OS moment. We've got a problem here because renewables don't have that grid penetration. Carbon sequestration hasn't been proven as a technology. So all the people in the room turn to little old me at the back and say, Paul, 100 gigawatts of nuclear, is it feasible? To which it's a challenge. We are a small country, but countries, I pointed out, do run large grids, Japan, France, the US. We also then looked at the, the ramp rate of new nuclear build, such as the N4 reactors in the 1980s in, in France. It is achievable to ramp up. 100 is a little bit too scary. Uh, obviously, in terms of our modesty in the UK, we felt, well, we'll just have to pull that down a little bit. It's a bit scary. Um, so we set a baseline target of 75 gigawatts of nuclear. At the moment, where are we now, and what has this led to? Well, we have new nuclear build programs in place for 16 gigawatts of nuclear. We are licensing AP1000, EPR, and the Advanced Boiling Water Reactor. We're going up to the second phase, which will be 32 gigawatts of nuclear, and then we need to look at where we go further. An interesting change happens in that at some point on that journey, we have to go back to a closed fuel cycle. You cannot survive at 75 gigawatts plus in the UK with an open, an open fuel cycle. Where are we now in terms of government interest in nuclear? Not only are we on this journey, but we've launched programs associated with small modular reactors. 
And we've also launched a, a new uh, 350 million US dollar program in nuclear energy R&D, looking at advanced generation four reactors and also uh, closed fuel cycle. And so the House of Lords effectively have concluded that we are going back to the top table as far as nuclear is concerned. We are going to be a leading country in terms of our nuclear policy. Interestingly as well, we have just launched our industry strategy in the UK, recognising, of course, uh, we are in a post-Brexit, or we will soon be in a post-Brexit era, and that's a big challenge for us, but it's also an opportunity. And for nuclear, this is a, a fantastic opportunity, because the government is now looking at what industries is it going to rely on in terms of manufacturing. Nuclear represents that nice, warm comfort blanket that the government is going to need in a post-Brexit world of a long-term, sustainable engineering, science and technology-based uh, industry sector. And that's written in, effectively, to our industry strategy now. Lord Hennessy uh, has studied industry strategies since 1945 in the United Kingdom. And so far, there have been eight industrial strategies. And he points out, and he's pointed out to government, we got it wrong in 1955, because in 1955, we forgot to recognize the importance of science, technology, and innovation in an industrial strategy. That's why this industrial strategy is now so focused on science, technology, and uh, innovation. We've also set up the Nuclear Industry Council, which brings together industry and government, uh, I am sitting on that and I leave tonight to attend that meeting tomorrow in London, which is where we will set out a long-term strategy for the United uh, Kingdom in terms of not just meeting our domestic requirements, but also our export agenda growth opportunities as well. So when I look back over the past 15 years, it's been an absolutely fascinating journey and it just shows uh, what can happen as far as uh, countries are concerned in their energy policy. And uh, I do hope in this era of um, surprise politics that we are now experiencing that um, the U.S. Will, uh, will come with us on this journey and we look forward to collaborating strongly with the United States in the, in the coming years. Thank you very much.